So this is the last slide that we have uh, looked at. Um, during our last lecture. No, that's the last slide here. Okay. So we talked about the cable installations, um, the difference between free, free air and, uh, and raceway runs, right? Cable installation begins with establishing the pathways. Um, so <clears throat> there are so many different stages. And, you know, if, if I wanted to show you my 30 years experience on this, I would have to take you for a 30 years of a course instead of uh, you know whatever the time we have together so i'm just uh, i'm giving you a heads up um, um, on uh, on what you might encounter during this type uh, while you work in this type of a field chances are that once you graduate that uh, there, there are actually pretty good chances that you're going to end up in some sort of job that involves the stuff that i'm actually showing you here okay all right, so we talked about the free air runs and the raceways. Let's just kind of recap for two seconds. Main runs, for, so free air runs. Main runs should be kept in bundles and suspended independently of any ceiling structures. We talked about that. We can't tie anything to anything. Um, wire runs should be suspended independently. And usually uh, when it comes to data cabling or infrastructure of this sort, Mm, J hooks are the order of the day quite often, or cable trays or conduits. Uh, as much as possible, establish straight runs so pulling multiple cables can be done efficiently. Of course, if you establish a straight path um, and if you have multiple runs to, to perform, then the straighter the straight path is, the better it is going to be for you. And, uh, when you strain pulling the wires, uh, first of all, the job go gets slower, but also there is a chance that uh, some of the wires that are existing in whatever the run is uh, might get damaged due to the friction. And when it comes to friction, use lube. And when it comes to using lube, I'm saying it again, use the lube that is designed for, uh, for cable installations. Right? Because um, uh, if you use something else, you don't know the chemical consistency of whatever that is. And uh, some common practices that are a no-no I have seen is people just going to the washroom, get a paper towel and squirt some sort of liquid soap on it. And that's gonna get you through. Don't do that. You don't know the chemical consistency of the soap and you don't know what it is going to do to the cables in the long run, okay? Uh, J hooks mounted on the walls or suspended from the ceiling on the threaded rods are the most common, are most common uh, in this scenario. So J hooks are very popular, and I will talk about the J hooks a little bit. And threaded rods, raceways. So if you run the cable in free air or raceways. So as I said before, the cable tray is some sort of a combination of free air and raceway. Because you know, tray, cable tray is just laid this thing on top of the tray. So uh, technically, it's it's, it's a, just another perspective of or another version of a free air run, except it's way a little bit more organized because it's in a tray uh, instead of the, um, just suspended over the J hooks. Uh, all the raceways should be installed before the cable run, cables are run. Um, so that's a big part of the job, right? So sometimes if it's a bigger project, um, you, would, uh, you would find that it will take you maybe a week or two or more just to install the J-hooks uh, or cable trays and things like that. So it's a huge part of the job. Uh, and hint, hint, position the J-hooks, if you use J-hooks, uh, position them no further than four feet apart in order to avoid the sagging of the wires. If you have a big bundle and that bundle sags, which basically just goes you know, just in waves like this, because that's where the hook is, uh, that's not good because it creates pressure in that point on, on the wires, especially the wires on the bottom of the bundle. Okay, um, okay. so let's uh, start with the new content for today. We talked about threaded rods. I'm going to, to talk about uh, some common situations and, and common equipment that can be used um, and that is used. So if somebody is going to talk about threaded rods or Unistrad, 
um, or, or things like that, you know what they're talking about. Uh, it's a little bit long way be, between, you know, from, from, from actually seeing this thing on the video that I'm talking to you about uh, and actually doing it. Because uh, uh, when, when you do something with your hands, when you actually physically uh, participating in, in, in performing certain type of tasks, you're going to come up with uh, come up uh, uh, come up on some challenges that uh, you're going to have to solve. But this is an introduction to that. So uh, so basically, you know uh, what squeaks in the grass. You know what somebody's talking about, uh, or when you're going to be sent uh, on the uh, on the job site with somebody who's already doing that, and you're going to be watching it or participating in it. It's going to be that much easier for you because at least you will know what they're talking about and you will know the terminology of things. So threaded rods, um, what are they? It's a relatively long rod that is threaded at both ends, or sometimes the thread is all the way through. Go to a Home Depot or Lowe's or Rona or whatever uh, hardware store and uh, look at some threaded rods. They have a section, and usually in the hardware sections uh, in there, um, um, you can you will be able to see different lengths of the threaded rods and different diameters. So they are very popular thing that go to things, and you can cut them to make them shorter, and you can join them with couplers and things. Uh, very very uh, uh, common uh, piece of uh, piece of equipment that uh, that, uh, that you'll be using here. So you can see here's an example of how those are being used. Here's a piece of Unistrad two pieces of that and the and the threaded rods are suspended from the ceiling so here there you go so there's a tray suspended from the ceiling using the threaded rods right now from that we're going to go into something that's called a strat channel and unistrat unistrat is uh, is a very common thing um <clears throat> and on this picture okay first of all what is it what is it Strat channel or uni strat. All right, it's a standardized formed structural system. Wow, here's a definition used in construction and, and electrical industries for light structural support, often for supporting wiring, plumbing, or mechanical components. Uh, such as uh, air conditioning or ventilation systems. So it's quite universal thing. Think of it as Lego for the grown-ups. And uh, so if when you get the Lego blocks, uh, you are able to do, you know, play around um, and do all kinds of constructive things with it. So this is the, uh, this is the big version of Lego. Right? And you can cut. Now, one thing I'm going to mention, uh, threaded rods and the strut, especially the strut, is made out of galvanized metal. Galvanizing is uh, it's a chemical treatment that makes uh, that prevents the rust, most, most of the stuff. Um, so um, when you're cutting it, okay, be very careful. Because when you, you can cut this with hacksaw, but it's, uh, you know, you're going to have some, so if you have to cut one or two, yeah, okay. But if you have to cut a bunch, uh, uh, then you're going to get some um, some mechanical devices like saws and whatnot. Uh, when, uh, when you cut galvanized metal, uh, there are going to be sparks flying because, uh, you know, upon the friction, there's going to be a little bit of a, um, a heat that's being produced, okay? So do not breathe in those fumes. Those fumes are really bad for you. How exactly they're bad uh, and what is exactly is going to do to you if you breathe them, I'm not going to get into it because, you know, I don't have the credentials. So, you know, I'm, not a, I'm not a doctor, but uh, I know that uh, the fumes that are going to be produced by cutting galvanized metal uh, with mechanical devices, power tools, then, uh, uh, then do not breathe those fumes. And you might want to get some PPE like masks or do it in a well-ventilated area. Okay? Uh, so struts, you can cut, you can you buy most these sections, longer sections, and you can cut them in pieces and, uh, and, and just use them as Lego blocks. Um, common types of struts would be a solid channel. So that's what this thing looks like. Then uh, punched channel. So you can have openings or holes. You can, you can use, uh, you can run screws through it or bolts and whatever. Um, 
and then there's a half slotted channel, right? So instead of holes, you have slots in the in the U-shaped channel there, and slotted channel. And of course, you got half channel, so it's basically not as tall. And also, there's the extended ones that uh, that are really, but well, it's not listed here, so it's like much taller than that, all right? So that's the basic, uh, and here's the references. You know. How do we use that? We use the spring, uh, spring nuts, right? Let me just uh, zoom that thing here. Whoa, whoa. Uh, okay, what's happening here? Sorry about that, something is happening. Here, here, okay. Basically what I did is I made a link and I clicked on that by accident. So that's what happened. I'll be in my browser, no thank you. All right, so that's what the spring knot looks like, okay. What you do here is that you have a threaded area here and you insert that spring nut into that channel. So you twist it one way, you can slide it in and twist it the other way so it stays in. And here's the threaded part. So you can, um, uh, you can insert a bolt or a nut or um, a bolt in there um, to mount whatever equipment that you're mounting. Or sometimes you can even uh, insert the threaded rods in there too. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, I said click to watch. So once you download this uh, PDF version, uh, go ahead, click and watch. You know? Pretty simple instructions. And I'm getting tangled with my wires here. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. All right, so that's the Unistrat or Strat channel. So we talked about the threaded rods. The strat channel, we're going to keep going. J hooks. J hooks can be mounted on threaded rods. All right, there are different uh, piece of equipment that you can. So that's why I'm, I'm showing you the different ways of mounting things because depending on the construction of things, uh, you can use threaded rods and you can fasten them to the, to this, to the steel beams. Or there are different uh, different attachments, different um, different gadgets you can buy in order to properly mount uh, things onto things. So here's a threaded rod, and there is, there are one, two, three J hooks, all right? Uh, and sometimes the J hooks are on both sides. You can have J hook here, you can have a J hook here, and another J hook here. Uh, so you can one, two, three, four, five, six J hooks on this thing, and uh, sometimes it's you know there's a lot of wires to be pulled, right? So there's uh, using the threaded rods with the J hooks. This is using the J hooks on mounting them on the wall, all right? So uh, here the you can get brackets for the J hooks, or the J hooks come in different uh, shapes and different mounting ways as well. And the J hooks can be metallic, or the J hooks can also be plastic, and they are also of different sizes. When you buy them, look at uh, look at the specifications because the bigger the J hook is, the more wire it can handle. And when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to reading the specs on the J hooks, or if you go to a distributor or a store, they will tell you because they, they sell that stuff and they know over here. Would you use this size of a J hook? Uh, this particular one, uh, you you know, it's rated uh, for maybe a, a twenty or thirty or fifty um, Cat five E cables. If you, uh, you know, if you want to do more, then it's just gonna fit. So um, um, so here is the J hooks things idea, all right? J hooks, more J hooks. J hooks can be mounted in various different ways. Sometimes you're going to mount the threaded rods into a concrete slab that's in the ceiling. So there are different types of mounts or fasteners that we're going to use. Screws, bolts, nuts, and all that uh, stuff, clips and whatnot, they, they classify as fasteners. Okay. 
so let's take a look at some of the ways of mounting things. All right. Here is the Titan threaded rod hanger. Let me zoom things here. You drive that just like a top con screw into, a, into the concrete and it has a threaded head right here that if you match the size of this bolt and the size of the threaded rod, of course, then you can use it like that. Right? So you just drive that thing into the concrete in the ceiling using a hammer drill. Well, no, you use the hammer drill to, draw, to drill the hole. Do not use a hammer drill to drive that thing in. Just use a regular drill. You don't want any impact on that because you're going to shatter the, shatter the opening and you won't have as much uh, hold to it. Okay? And uh, when it comes to concrete ceiling, uh, sometimes you just get a bare ceiling, bare concrete ceiling. And sometimes you have the perforated metal. Sometimes you're going to see that this, this is a concrete and it's, it's basically covered with the steel, uh, perforated steel um, surface there. Right? So it makes, uh, makes the installation a little bit longer because that, it's a tough steel. So what do you use to drill to that? Uh, well, first you're going to use a steel drill bit that goes through the steel and you're not going to use hammer action. You're just going to puncture through that uh, through that steel. Once you puncture through that steel, you change the drill bits, use a concrete bit and use a hammer drill because you need some impact. Uh, uh, so the, some of the installations do take longer. Right? Now, when you have the MMMF on top of that, sometimes it makes it even worse. So write it down. It's a triple MF, MMMF. It is, it stands for man-made mineral fiber. And we talked about that last time, uh, last uh, term. Uh, it's a type of insulation, but the fibers uh, are pretty much just as dangerous as asbestos. And it looks like a sewage, dry sewage sprayed onto the ceiling, um, like a gray kind of a mass, dry gray mass. And uh, so sometimes it's MMMF and sometimes it's a different type of insulation that is not it. And there's no way to tell until, un unless you take it to a lab and they take it under their microscope and whatever testing equipment so they can tell if, whether it's MMMF or not. Research that, it is going to save your life because uh, sometimes you're just going to go into the ceiling and muck around with different type of insulation, not knowing what dangers are hiding there uh, because you're going to breathe all that in. Right. Um, all right, so this is one type of mounting threaded rods or bolts or nuts. It doesn't have to be threaded rod, it could be just a bolt uh, holding something. Okay. Another way would be the drop in anchors. And do they have do they have a video here? No, there's no video here, but I have a link here to uh, to the manufacturer's uh, video. So click on it later and watch it. Okay. Drop-in anchors are also common things, um, and they can hold a lot of pounds, right? Those drop-in anchors, they can hold something like 950 kilos, which is uh, like, a, like a ton. But always always look at, uh, you know, even, even if this thing is rated for whatever poundage, uh, when it comes to the weight that it can hold, you also, you have to research the type of uh, surface that this thing is going in, right? Is that able to, uh, of course, it's not going to hang a ton on it. Uh, most of the time, you're going to hang a bunch of wires. And you know what? Those wires weigh. They have weight, right? Uh, the cable tray and the wires in it then weighs even more, right? So you need some sort of solid, solid mountings so things that don't fall on people's heads when you mount them, right? Uh, so um, when, uh, when choosing those anchors and things, so anchors, screws, nuts, bolts, they all classify as fasteners. So um, in order for you to, um, to choose the proper stuff, establish some sort of a relationship with some sort of a fastener company that is around you. What do we have here in London, Ontario? Right? We do have FACA fasteners, which is not too far from our college. 
uh, go visit them. Uh, they know about screws and nuts and bolts and anchors and where what should be used and where. Maybe you're going to narrow things down to some of your favorites that you're going to use. You know, um, so and 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 those those guys they're, they're very helpful. What else do we have uh, around uh, around here? Uh, we do have uh, Fastenal, right? Um, uh, that's that's also popular popular shop and other fastener places even some of the electrical shops electrical supply stores they will carry some of that and if they don't they will refer you to some uh, fastener places uh, establish some relationships with some distributors that are around the area some of the local electrical distributors hardware distributors uh, you know um, it's a normal if, if 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 you run a business on your own then you're going to have all that uh, stuff all those contacts established and your favorite suppliers and things like that and even if you work for somebody else for uh you know if you work for you're going to be asked to perform certain tasks so you know if you see certain situation oh i could use this type of anchors in this it's going to be best for that and it's going to be you know some other one is going to be best for that so you know what what is what uh, and you know where to get it okay so drop in anchors um Usually, well, they are they are meant to work in the concrete ceilings. Okay. I have uh, installed some of them. Um, now, the way you drive that thing in is you drill a specific, well, it's specified size because you're going to have the instructions with it, in the spec sheets, and it's going to call for certain size of a hall and certain depth of a hall. So of course you're going to you these are a little bit bigger than you know quarter inch. You know, sometimes they're, they're half inch bolts or anchors. Excuse me, or even thicker. Okay. So you're going to have to drill to get according uh you have to choose the size of the drill bit accordingly. Okay, so again, uh, you might, uh, if it's one, two, or three, or four, you can get your regular hammer drill, and mostly that's not going to be cordless. Uh, it's going to be power drill with a, you just plug it into the wall. Um, you can you can just drill uh, some holes with your regular uh, you know, drill. Now, when it comes to doing a bigger job that you have to do 500 of them, then you're going to have to get some heavier equipment to drill that because uh, you don't want to you don't want to take maybe two minutes to drill a hole. You might want to take uh, maybe 25 seconds to drill that hole. Okay, uh, and um, so it all adds up uh, to the time. Plus, if you if you spend more time and you have to spend more energy on that, it's going to tire you out uh, and maybe uh, get some. You know, when you're tired, all kinds of things happen, right? So I'm not going to get into the in that part, but you know, you know what I mean, okay? Uh, so <clears throat> you drill a hole and then you put that in, and there is an attachment that can use a hammer to drive that in. You you you. You drive it, you put that attachment inside and you hammer that in so it stays. So that part expands. So this part right here expands in the hall. And um, and then it stays in and you can just drill, uh, not dr you can drive a uh, bolt or, uh, or a threaded rod in it, uh, whatever the situation calls for, it, right? But also when you have some of the heavier uh, drilling equipment, uh, they are attachments, so uh, they are quick, kind of a lock and load attachments. So uh, you get a drill bit, lock and load, and drill the hole. Then you're just gonna take this out and get the uh, get the um, get the reamer there, and then it just go da -da 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 -da, right, and that's it. So it reams that thing in. Uh, so. Uh, because if you have, if you have to have use a hammer and just go bang 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 okay you know if it's uh, if again if I say it's three four five of those uh, yes okay no problem but if if it's a bigger job and it's a regular part of doing if you're going to do this for two weeks straight then you, you better get some equipment and if, if you can't buy that sometimes you're just gonna buy it right some of those bigger drills um, then you can also rent them okay all right. And here is a click to watch thing about that. Uh, also, 
what you might find in some situations, you're going to use something that's called a chemical bond mountings, right? Let's just see what I wrote. No, I didn't write that. I took it from, uh, uh, from somewhere. I just put it here. Here's a reference to that. I took it from Wiki or somewhere else. Okay, chemical anchors. Right? Chemical anchors refer to bonding used between metallic elements and the substrate materials. What are substrate materials? Here's a definition of what substrate means in our context. Basically, it's the area that the chemical is going to work on. So if you try to glue a um, couple of sticks together, those sticks would be the substrate material because the glue is going to work on them, okay? So uh, again, chemical anchors refer to bonding used between metallic elements and the substrate materials. So in our case, the metallic element would be the, uh, the anchor. So the anchor begins here and Sometimes it just has a threaded, uh, uh, it's threaded, or sometimes it's going to be an anchor that you put something in there, all right? So you're bonding, you're bonding the metal with the concrete. It's quite often, uh, it's very common when you, when, when you use cinder blocks, right? Cinder blocks are the big bricks, the big gray bricks, the big gray bricks, right? Um, so that's a cinder block right here. The problem with the cinder block uh, is that if you use regular anchors, the reamers, um, then that, that material is not dense enough and it's going to chip away and it's going to loosen up. And if you have something that, uh, that's heavier that is hanging somewhere, especially in the where there's public, people walk underneath that, you don't want to take any risks. So you don't want to uh, use just regular anchors and just get some couple of uh, screws in you know, hardware store somewhere around the corner and, uh, and go and sleep at night nice and easy because you're going to be thinking, uh, is this, uh, could, could I be getting a phone call that thinks that I mounted this followed somebody's head? You don't want to do that, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so chemical bonds are, are working great with the center blocks. Right? Uh, now, when it comes to do that, uh, when it comes to the chemical bonds or chemical anchors, uh, you need to very carefully read the specification sheets and the safety data sheets on that because sometimes there's some PPE that's required. And I'm really, really serious about that. Listen to me when I say this. Sometimes, you don't want uh, some of the chemicals, you don't want to contact with your skin because it's going to work in your bloodstream and it's going to do some nasty things to you. It's not going to be pretty, all right? So sometimes it's going to call for you to wear latex gloves when you're handling that. Sometimes you're going to have to wear masks, a specific type of a mask, so you don't breathe the fumes. And so you got to read the safety data sheets. This is just a um, this is just one of the chemical bonds that I found on the internet, but there are a bunch of them. So check with your some local, some of your local distributors, uh, what's available in our area or whatever the area uh, that you're working in, or uh, maybe uh, there's going to be some of the favorite stuff that you can order online. So let's just uh, get back to this definition here. Chemical anchors refer to bonding used between metallic elements and the substrate materials. The metallic elements in this case include rods, uh, while the substrate material could be brick or mortar. Synthetic resin um, adhesives are used to form the bond. They are highly effective when used in high load applications. I used to have a situation that uh, I, would, I was taking care of one of the schools um with the technical support and uh, there was a time that uh, i used to carry it, uh, i would uh, maintain the cctv equipment that's there um and the school was just built and um, the brackets for the tvs because right now the tvs are much smaller than uh, well not as 
not as deep, you know, we've got flat screen TVs, you rarely can see that CRT, you know, you know what a CRT is, you might not know. A CRT is cathode ray too, is the big old TV and it's heavy. And some, and every classroom would have that big 32 inch TV hanging there. Um, and those would be hanging on the brackets that would be mounted on the center blocks. So I had to hang those TVs there to, you know, to get this, you know, get them ready for September. And I rejected the mountings because I looked at it, I came up to it, I moved, and I could see the anchors were already moving and there was no TV there yet. So can you imagine if students were walking underneath that uh, and it's a high, it was a high school environment. So uh, of course the uh, you know people would be touching it, leaning on it or something like that. Right. So I rejected it twice and finally the company came and they installed the chemical bonds and that thing stayed in, it stayed for good, right? So heavy loads, uh, chemical bonds are pretty good when it comes to heavy loads, All right? So uh, this is, um, you can zoom this here, this is a cross section of a center block. So there's a hole driven there of a certain size and there's a procedure that whatever the chemical is and whatever the anchor system that you're going to use is going to have, you're going to have clear instructions and probably there's going to be a website and probably, you know what, it's going to be also even a YouTube video with instructions on, uh, on, on, on how to handle that. So here is all the chemical bond that's inside the brick and it's coming on the other side and it's bonding the metallic piece with the concrete. Chemical anchor, okay, chemical bond. Sometimes you need to do that. All right, so enough with the anchors. Keep going with the site work. What is it that you might encounter? I'm giving a technical lingo here. So I'm going to, we're going to talk about rocks as well. Uh, when, you're, when you walk into our labs, you can see a lot of rocks. The, um, the equipment that we have, the oscilloscopes, uh, the power supplies, the function generators, and all it's a rack system, a couple of rails on the side, and there's a shelf, and there's a shelf, and sometimes the, the equipment is mounted on those rails, and the rails are holding it together, and it's just making a self-sufficient rack, right? So sometimes you can do that too, right? But uh, quite often you're going to use the uh, equipment rack or server rack, right? Uh, so there's there, there, there are specific size of the rack, there are standardized sizes, and there are some that's called the rack space units. So what is inside an equipment rack? This is a floor rack, and it actually this one is on wheels. And as far as racks, there could be swivel racks, floor mounted racks, closet types of racks. Um, wall mounted, floor mounted, ceiling mounted, uh, closed on all sides, closed on just two sides, uh, with the doors, without the doors. There, you know, I, I feel like, uh, you know, that uh, Forrest Gump movie when this guy was talking about different kinds of ways to prepare a shrimp, but that's as far as the rack goes, okay? So, um, but the, the, What's the same about the rack is they have the rails, the rack rails on one side, and there's one you can't see it here. And they are spaced in a standardized way. And the equipment that is rack mountable is also fulfills the mounting standards to be mounted. So, um, so you can pretty much buy any equipment rack and that's going to suit your needs. And the size of that is going to be the same. It's called 19 inches, right? And 19 inches is from edge to edge. We're gonna talk about that a couple of slides down the road. And what do you see here in this particular rack? You can see a shelf mounted. Oh, that shelf can be removed from those rails and should be taken away or moved up or you know, higher or lower. And again, a PDU is a very common thing for the racks. What's a PDU? It's a power distribution unit because you don't want to run a bunch of um, power bars and extension cords and uh, think that you have done some professional installation. Plus, there's a certain type of power that's going into the equipment. And those PDUs, they have some um, overload protection and spark protection or spike uh, protection and so on. Uh, and some of them even have, because it's a, it's a glorified power bar. And this one is rack mountable. 
Sometimes you're going to get, see those mounted on the racks, and if they take one space unit, all right, uh, and sometimes you're going to see those mounted on the walls. And some of them even will have uh, sequential, they're sequential power bars, so sequential PDUs. What's a sequential PDU? Let's say it's not a sequential, this one, let's say this one is not a sequential PDU, which means you flip that switch on, all the power outlets are coming on at the same time. Right? And sometimes if it's a, a lot of equipment there, and if they're going to draw the current all at the same time, you're going to have a huge overload momentarily, right? And sometimes you don't want that. Right? So uh, <clears throat> uh, some of the bars or the PDUs, they will be sequential. What does it mean? Is that when you flip the switch on, the power outlets are coming on sequentially. So it's going to go, this one is going to come on. Maybe two seconds later, that one. Maybe a second later, that one, and that one, and that. And so there's no um, one common draw from all the equipment. It's just uh, gradually powering up the things. Okay? And some of them are programmable, some are not. So, uh, hey, you know, sky's the limit. Uh, it's, it's just you're in the beginning of this journey. It depends on what you're going to be installing and for what purpose. And sometimes when you're pricing things, you're going to have to do a little research of what's needed. Okay? So let's just uh, look at the 19-inch rack. Okay, a 19-inch rack is a standardized frame or enclosure for mounting multiple electronic equipment modules. Okay. Each module <clears throat> has a front panel that is 19 inches wide. The 19 inches dimension includes, uh, includes the edges or ears. What are the ears of the rack? Let me just... Um, if this is, is, let's say it's an audio amplifier, for example, because it is used in music industry as well. All right, so here's an amplifier. There's some knobs, a couple of knobs, and maybe some indicators here, and blah, 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 right? That's an audio amplifier. And it's basically, it looks like this. Yeah. And it has maybe some bands here or whatever. Now, it can be standing on its own with some feet, rubber feet. Uh, or what it can be is uh, most of the professional equipment that you're going to notice some sort of screws here, kind of here and on the other side as well. And those would be for the rack ears. And the rack ears sometimes are going to be included in the box, but they're not going to be mounted on it because nobody knows what you're going, how we're going to use that amplifier. But the rack ears would be an L bracket like this. Oh, I'm dripping again here. Right? And this would have the rack mounting screws or holes. And over here, it would be the same thing, like that. And they would be mounted here. So you unscrew that and screw them back in, or, or maybe there's some additional screws. And there would be rack mounting holes. And from here to here, this edge to this edge, it is going to be 19 inches. So that's a 19 inch rack. And these are the rack ears. Okay. All right, so let's say each module, ha each module has a front panel that is 19 inches wide. The 19 inches dimension includes the edges or ears to that protrude from each side of the equipment, allowing the module to be fastened to the rack frame with screws or bolts. Common uses include computer servers for the racks, computer servers, telecommunications equipment and networking hardware, audiovisual production gear and scientific equipment. So the rack is a rack, is a rack. It can hold many things. It's a, and it's a standardized way, 19 inches. Mm -hmm. All this information I'm feeding you. As I said, there are different types of racks, equipment racks. This is a 
there's like a small closet, right? It's about you know six feet tall or maybe eight feet tall. Um, this is a simple wall-mounted rack. It depends on what they're going to use and in what kind of situation. Uh, if you're going to do a job and if you're going to design a project, you sometimes are going to do a little research and you're going to choose a rack and uh, let's say, oh, this is not available anymore. Is this continued? Okay, who else is carrying this type of rack? And so on. You know, online thing right now is quite uh, quite popular. So, uh, you know, and but a lot of the local distributors uh, carry this stuff uh, also. And you can just, you know, there's nothing better than walking into a store and actually touching the equipment, seeing how it opens and what's inside. And you know, the online thing is great, but uh, there's a, there are pros and cons uh, to everything. Uh, as far as the rails, okay. So here's a bit of a dimensioning going on. What is a rack? So here is the unit. You see, here's a one U, one U, one U, and usually it will be three holes is one U. It's a one unit, right? Rack unit space, right? Um, and that would be something like, uh, whoa, I gotta, come on, go back, all right? Um, from top to bottom, uh, what do we have here? 1.75, 1.752 inches. Right. You have a little bit of a play so you can equip, the equipment can be aligned. Uh, so you can see, for example, here, the previous slide. Go away. Go back. I said back. There, All right? So you can see that this PDU here is a one unit. It's a one U. Some of the amplifiers or or servers or servers or or um, switches, patch panels, they're specified as one U, two U. 3U sometimes, so it's so now you know what the U is. Okay, U is U. Okay. And of course, from right from here, from here, from one edge to the other edge, it's 19 inches. It's a, it's, it's a standard thing. It's a common thing. Sometimes you're going to see an oddball equipment or an oddball rack. Um, you always specify it's 19, 19 inches equipment. 19 inches and it's just, sometimes you're going to say, okay, we need 19 inch rack, okay? Uh, and if you're ordering some of the equipment, they say, does it come with the rack uh, ears or is it rack mountable? Yes, it is. 19 inches? Yes, 19 inches. Okay, so that's you know, with the telephone conversations you would have. Uh, if you're ordering some sort of equipment here. Okay? So we took care of the vertical si uh, sizing and the horizontal sizing, and you can analyze that if you want, but um, you know what the unit is and the, uh, and the, the width of this rack now, okay? Here, yeah, let me go down here. Now, when it comes to mounting the equipment into the rails of the rack, there are a couple of different ways. You can use the nut clips if the rack is, if the rack rails are unloaded. Or the rack rails can come with pre drilled holes or threaded holes. You gotta make sure what you're getting. I'm talking about mounting a piece of equipment here and using the mounting screws so the equipment actually stays in that uh, in that rack okay so some of the rails you're going to see them with just those square openings like that and some of the rails this is the front of it this is this is the side this is the front of the rail and you can actually see there Mount there, the, the units, the U spaces are actually marked here. 
so you can count the units and count the units of the equipment that you're ordering and just to make sure that the rag is big enough, big enough, right? Uh, so the, this one here comes with the pre-drilled holes and you use the rack screws or rack bolts for that. They are designed to fit specifically into the rack uh, pre-drilled holes. And uh, there are plastic washers sometimes because some of the equipment looks nice, nicer than others. Um, and when you when you when you fasten, because you need to have a really hard mount onto it uh, because uh, you just mounted on the front rack ears, and quite often the whole rest of it it's unsupported. Sometimes you get a support bar at the back, and sometimes you don't. So that whole weight weigh, uh, rests on that on those rack ears. So it has to be done nicely. Uh, so uh, sometimes you're just going to crank it up and those plastic washers are going to just, um, you know, um, relieve some of the possibility of, of, of some of the equipment getting scratched or, or damaged in a certain, certain way. Right? Sometimes you use them, sometimes I don't. Right? Uh, so you got to make sure that the rack you're ordering, what kind of rails it has. And it's always a good idea to get, and if you go to the to, 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 to a distributor that uh, that sells telecommunications equipment, um, if you just say, do you carry any rack screws? They will know exactly what you're talking about. Right? And sometimes you might want to specify the size. Of it. And it's always a good idea to have a stash in your van uh, that uh, if you need some more, uh, when you're on the side, uh, if you're running out of them, sometimes when the equipment is being shipped, they forget to ship the screws. It's always a good idea to have those screws or the, 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 the rack screws or rack, rack bolts. Right? But sometimes they come unloaded and sometimes they come with the, uh, the pre-drilled holes. So if it's the unloaded with the, with the openings there, you're going to use these clips. And these clips, you just clip on and you use clip on only those that you're going to use, right? And uh, then of course, when it comes to those, those uh, clip nuts, these are clips. Right? Uh, you just clip it onto that, uh, uh, onto these uh, openings right here. And then you drive the screws in or the nuts or the, the bolts, <laughs> the bolts, okay? Uh, so, <clears throat> Uh, there's a lot of things to consider, right? A lot of things to remember. When you make a checklist, um, just make sure that you have everything that you, that you need when you go to work on the site. Right? And uh, the less hiccups like that you have, the more employable you're going to be. All right? And is that the last slide? This is the last slide for today. So we talked about, uh, well, I'll just give you the scope of things that, um, that you may encounter. Now, did I give you everything? No, no. But I gave you the basics, right? So with the, with the whole thing that we had gone through since September, that uh, we talked about the SFTY51, I think it is. Um, mm, with the termination types and the equipment that you use in the electrical and the raceways. And then we took on the data infrastructure type of thing. You have pretty much good basis to either start something. Um, well, I wouldn't start a business on your own yet if you haven't done it at all. I would suggest if you want to start your own business, work for a company for a little bit so you get familiar with the environment and everything that goes around it right and then you can uh, but right now you have enough information to go on so you can apply for jobs and you would be pretty good at understanding uh, what somebody is talking about when they're asking you to do something or when they're showing you something and explaining the procedure, you understand what they're talking about. And the rest is just come. The rest just comes with the experience. Right? Don't expect that you're going to do everything 100% right away. And if it takes you slower, that's okay. It's the nature of things. And before you know, you're going to be a pro in doing that kind of stuff and, uh, and you enjoy going to work.
All right, so that's that concludes this whole um, whatever amount of months that we have with each other. I enjoyed the trip with you guys. It was a blast. Uh, it was a good, good, good term. Actually, two terms that we had each other, with each other. Thank you for your attention and uh, participation and all that stuff. And I will see you when I see you because we still have a week and a half of labs to do together. All right. So it was a blast. Thank you very much. And this concludes the two semesters that we had with each other as far as the theory. Okay. I'm going to do the salute and the wave. <laughs> Love you guys. Bye. Thank you. And don't be a stranger. Come over, send me an email. If you have questions, go ahead. Shoot straight. All right. I'll give you the answers. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Oh, you can you couldn't see my salute and my wave because I had that thing off. All right. Here's a salute. Here's the wave. All right.